we started making names right away. And we, I loved it. I was robbing drug dealers and taking their gold right off their neck. The shit we did, you know, who's going to call the police on you? A drug dealer? <laughs> I can identify with anything that was normal, to be honest with you. But I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. 99% of the time, you're going to disagree. Just like the Dummy Roscoe situation with Lefty. Yeah, or the reason why they figure it this way. You brought this guy around, he ratted on everybody, now he ratted on you. You might turn around and join him and rat on us, so if we get rid of you, there's no connection between there and there, and they get rid of you. To this episode of Chatting with Stacks, I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today, I got Robert Lasardo. What's up, Robert? Hey, how are you, Bill? I'm doing great, man. Thank you for uh, taking your time and coming on my show. I appreciate that. My pleasure. So you have an insane catalog of work that you've done. But I want to know about your earlier days before the movies. What was it like in New York? Well, it was a lot different than it is now. New York City was, uh, you know, just like this untamed animal, you know, and there was something, uh, I guess, adventurous and dangerous and creative all at the same time. The city it was kind of a magical time to be in New York in the 70s. John Lennon was around and uh, Andy Warhol was still alive. And uh, it was an interesting combination of elements. You know, uh, they didn't always integrate well, but when they did, man, there was no place like it. Yeah, it's like the melting pot of the of the whole country. Well, yeah, they were creative, you know, elements and, you know, and, and uh, influences that you know, uh, made impression and impact. And then there was also, you know, social uh, kind of uh, experiment going on. There was violence. There was, you know, that whole movie, that film that Walter Walter Hill made called The Warriors, you know, was kind of a case in point, almost a documentary of what was going on with the gangs in New York and stuff and how there was a lot of crime before the gentr uh, gentrification of various boroughs started happening like Brooklyn and uh, places in Queens and stuff, um, you know, there was a bit, it was much more raw back in the day and impoverished and not so, uh, uh, you know, not so, uh, the, the elite had moved in yet and purchased all the property and uh, made everything seem like Disneyland. The, yeah. the Disneyfication uh, uh, experiment hadn't happened yet. So there was an element of the city. I said that it was very, you know, Kind of, it was always a confrontational type of a place. It was very in your face, but at least you know, you knew where you stood with people. There was no pretense, you know. <laughs> what you know? was a day like that back then? What was a day like for you back then? Well, riding the subway was a, a task all in itself, man. That was uh, just getting on the train in the morning, going to school or going wherever was a. Uh, required a lot of patience um, <laughs> um a bit of navigating skills uh because there's so many damn people pushing their way into the trains i remember i used to get tired of getting stuck in there like a, a can of sardines so i just uh go in between where the uh, the trains connect and separate the gates and risk my life and crawl into the area where the you you know you, tr you change cars it's out in the open and uh it's a bit dangerous but it, it's expeditious you definitely go on the train faster that way yeah and back like, then you know there were no cameras in the subway so something like that you did that now or try any kind of thing that steps outside the program they'd arrest you know you get arrested but back in that, those days there were no cameras down in the subway so there's a lot of things you could get away with uh in terms of just being able to move more efficiently if there were too many people on the train you know you find another way in kind of like it, the movie industry was it like that movie like people chasing you home from school or you're with your friends and you're chasing other people home from school was it like that yeah i think i was you know basically on both sides sides of the fence of that scenario maybe in the beginning uh you know i was uh assaulted and uh 
not treated well. And then I learned how to survive and flip the script a little bit. And then I realized both sides of it weren't proper and try to find a middle ground, you know, and just be on my own and, uh, you know, not take any shit from anybody, but also not be, uh, not be rude. Yeah. Be respectful toward people. The military taught me that. What was it like going into the military? I know you went to a performing arts school before that, right? Mm -hmm. So what was it like being in the performing arts school and then going to the military? Was it like a, a shock to change of environment for you? Yes. It was quite shocking to wake up at 5 a.m. in Chicago, marching in the freezing weather uh, when I had just basically graduated a few months earlier. Yeah, it was... Uh, but I needed a slap in the face. I needed a wake up call, an extreme wake up call because of how I was existing. Uh, so the military was a shock, but a necessary medicine to cure me of the arrogance that I carried on my shoulder for so long that was getting me into trouble. And despite the catharsis of performing arts and you know being on stage and investigating the creative aspect of things, it wasn't enough to uh, shine a big, big enough light for me to see you know, what was possible. I was still kind of stuck in darkness. Yeah. And what was it like to go there and deal with other personalities in the Navy? I loved it, man. The boot camp is great. I met all these guys from down south. And uh, they loved me. They thought I was a rebel. They was like, you're Robert, you need to get this tattoo. And they described this tattoo. I didn't know what it was. And then re I realized it was a rebel flag. I said, hey, man, I'm from New York, brother. I'm not, uh, I'm not from down south. What am I going to be doing wearing a rebel flag? But they seemed to think it was appropriate, despite uh, the geography, because, I don't know, they just took a liking to me. And uh, I don't know, I just you get to meet all different types of people. And uh, you have no choice but to work together, man, or else, you know, or else. Yeah. So where were you stationed? Uh, first two years, I was stationed in a listening post during the Cold War uh, below Siberia, about 800 miles uh, down below uh, Russia. There's a listening post called ADAC. Uh, I was stationed there for two years. And that's like isolated. Pretty much, yeah. Just me and my dog. <laughs> I was a police officer uh, and also nar narcotics interdiction, uh, part of the narcotics interdiction team. and. Uh, so I did perimeter watches with the dog. Uh, we searched planes, the barracks, arrested people, stuff like that. And, you know, the theory was that if the, ra the Russians invaded, they'd come down the Aleutian chain. So there was it was an air base. There were Marines up there. They had nukes up there that they were guarding. And we were just kind of in the ready, standing in the ready for in case uh, that kind of scenario played out. There were Russian submarines uh, close to the island. And, you know, they played these games, those P-3 uh, propeller planes had this tracking devices in them, and they just track the subs, keep an eye on them. They'd be watching us, we'd be watching them. So that, I guess that was the more glamorous, exciting part of my tour over there while I was what, freezing my butt off. You know, Was there any situations that stand out to you, like uh, people getting caught with drugs or smuggling yeah, stuff sure. and you catching them? Yeah. I can think of a couple. We got a domestic call. Some guy was beating up on his wife, I guess, in one of the houses because they had for certain officers you could bring your family up there but you had to be a certain rank to be able to qualify for that but there was some kind of like domestic dispute and i remember the first time i pulled my gun and i went around the back of the house and they said yeah keep an eye if the guy comes out you know and i thought oh shit i'm gonna shoot somebody. i have to shoot somebody <laughs> there was that and then i remember there was a ship that docked in port and uh there was a fight on board the ship and i took the dog up there and uh my superior officer was trying to talk with the man and they got into a fight and then uh i remember uh the dog was crucial in that moment and i put him to the ground and you know just stuff like that just kind of wrestling around <laughs> and and uh my dog king he was a half german shepherd half doberman he was crucial in uh, the intimidation if i can uh, always handle things then king would step up and let him know yeah you trained yeah, dogs for a while right yeah i was uh yeah uh-huh yeah, I went, through a seven week, I went through a seven-week uh, certification course in, in Texas, uh, Lackland Air Force Base. 
and I was trained with my dog. They flew me and the dog from uh, uh, ADAC, Alaska, to uh, Texas. That's a change of uh, temperature and uh, how was that shocking to you? Well, you know, it was, yeah, I'll tell you, but you know, it's kind of funny. I, I never heard of chiggers. I never knew what a fucking chigger was until I looked up in my stomach before I had all my tattoos on my stomach. And I had all these bread marks. So I thought I had the plague. And I asked for somebody, I said, what the hell is wrong with me? I got all these red marks. Oh, oh those are chigger bites, man. You know, because we were doing some tactical stuff and getting dirty in the dirt and crawling around. And I guess the bugs bit got in my skin. They crawl up and in your skin and they kind of live there for a while. <laughs> I've never heard of those either. Yeah, they're called chiggers. They're just bugs, man. You know, and they just, you know, you get close enough to them, they will find a home in your body. They go under your skin? Mm hmm Oh, yep. my God. Yeah, it was weird. But, you know, once you realize what it is and you go to the medic and they give you some powder to put on, you know, you know, it's not it's the not knowing that kind of freaks you out. Man. Like, what's the hell's what's going on? Where, <laughs> where is that, that Texas? Know. Yeah, uh, San Antonio. L yeah. Lackland Air Force Base. I'm going to mark that off my list. <laughs> don't, don't go down there. Every time I go down to Texas, even now I'm down to Houston, I get bit by something. There's these bugs in the, that are all over the place when you walk in the grass. They get it. They like my feet, man. I tend to come away with all these bumps on my feet, these bites. So there's some, yeah, you got to watch Texas. I've heard stories. I'm not saying they hide place. in your boot, I like right? People in Texas, but you got to watch out for the bugs. huh? Yeah, they hide in your boot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've heard stories of people uh, finding snakes in their boots, things like that. Oh. Mm. I saw one of those, those uh, what do you call it? I can't remember the name of that kind of snake. Very poisonous type snake. Very short, the colors, I can't think of the name. But uh, he was staring right at me, man. I just backed up slowly with the dog, man. It's like, oh shit, is that a snake, right? Because it was so still, it looked like a stick. But then yeah. I took a closer look and I go, that's not a stick, that's a damn snake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they blend in. It's mm -hmm. it's crazy. Uh, I had yeah. someone on the show, Tim Freed. He gets bit by poisonous snakes. Hey. Brave soul. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> I wouldn't do it, man. Hey, each his own, you know. Yeah. So, do you have any stories about training with the dog that stand out in your mind? Um. Dog ever run away from that. you? you I just remember. Him down. Him. Yeah, well, you know, the captain of the base was impressed because King was a rock star, man. He performed better than any other dog in the class because it was divided. Be, you know, the class was divided and half of it was Army. The other half was Air Force. And it was just me. I was the only squid, the only Navy guy there. And uh, King made me look good. He was so well trained and uh, you can give him commands from a couple of hundred yards away and he just respond like a robot, man. He was so disciplined and uh, performed better than any other dog uh, dog team in, in the in, in the class. And I, we won an honor graduate, but I give the award to him because it wasn't me. I mean, I handled him well, but you know, he was just an amazing creature. Yeah, and you're and, the uh, only one representing the Navy there. Yeah. So it's kind of like a competition between... Yeah, they didn't like that. It didn't go over too well with the Army guys and, the, you know, the, the aviators. They weren't too happy about the decision. And ironically, the people who awarded me, the, you know, the, awarded us, King and I, um, the, you know, the honor graduate certificate, they were Air Force. Yeah. So, I mean. But anyway, um, like I said, uh, that was a nice moment. And I just remember, you know, them bringing some of their high ranking officers down to watch King perform on some of these obstacle courses because they were so impressed. And I just yeah. thought, wow, cool. And then when I went back to ADAC, my commanding officer, you know, was pre they appreciated uh, that, you know, I represented the security team so well. I got a letter of commendation from the from the captain and all that, the commander, Lack Lackman. And, so they were all telling me how I could walk on water and all this nonsense. But the point is, is that, you know, it went over well uh, because they were concerned about sending somebody at my rank, uh, you know, because I wasn't really high ranking at that point in the military uh, down there with such a you know large responsibility because the dog was worth more than I was, you know, in terms of the time and money they put into training that animal. Yeah. And so they were hoping that I could carry the responsibility and the weight of that task. Did you find a lot of people, were, were you catching a lot of people with drugs on the base and did the dog just sniff things like that out? Did you train yeah, them we to caught, do that? Yeah, we caught some people. Yeah, we, we caught some people. 
where they there's another element there's another element that i discovered later on which was kind of blew my mind i was at a convention tattoo convention making an appearance and i ran into a former uh, serviceman who was a chief i think he was a chief petty officer and he told me that he knew no i told he asked me where i was stationed i said the illusions he goes oh wow when were you there i told him when i was there from 81 to 83 and he said wow it's good you left when you did i said why because that whole command uh came under indictment uh there was an investigation going on <laughs> turned out i guess according to what he told me that some of the people i was working for were on the take man that's why we may weren't arresting as many people i was wondering why aren't we catching as many people because i guess maybe they had a side business so some of those guys uh, my, my uh, superior officers went to leavenworth according to the rumor wow. according to what this guy told me so i don't know so when you were towards your end of your military career did you have it in your mind what you wanted to do with your life what direction you wanted to go uh during my military career it dawned on me one day i was like wait a minute uh i miss performing on stage so you you figured i'm gonna go into acting when i get out is that your plan i i never had a concise plan man i was always just kind of like a wandering child going on instinct so there was no, you know, I didn't have a diagram about anything in front of me. I just know in my heart that I felt this gravitational pull, pull toward a friend of mine named Anthony Apeson, who was my teacher in, I, at the high school performing arts, who made quite an impression on me. He became a close friend, like surrogate father to me. So um, we kept in touch while I was overseas and stuff. And uh, he kept reminding me not to forget about the creative half of myself. And that was inspirational and kept me motivated. And, uh, and he, he showed me what was possible. It was just a question of me believing in it, you know, and I started to believe in it more and more and more, especially was when I was on board ship and the, one of my classmates, an actor uh, that's very well known, appeared on a TV show and I was, holy shit. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here in this floating prison? But I thought, well, it was part of my karma. And so then it just became about doing the time and getting out and then reacquainting myself with uh, the original aspect of i guess my calling my 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 being my you know whatever you know whatever the tendency is in this lifetime to go towards something everybody's drawn to something i was drawn to this feeling of uh, liberated consciousness while i was on stage and i like the way it felt to get in, you know, read a script and get lost in this fantasy of uh, performing Definitely. it felt good it wasn't for glory. It wasn't, you know, any kind of, you know, grandiose fantasy about being famous. It was simply something that I like to do. And people told me I was good at it. And I was like, okay. And uh, it just seemed organic. It seemed like I was finally being honest, embracing a part of myself that I had ignored for so long and try to suppress it because of a different thought that was overtaking my consciousness you know and a lot of it had to do i think with you know the impressions and the the influence of things around me growing up in new york and you know a lot of young men struggle with identity when they're young trying to figure out who they are where they belong what their purpose is you know so it can be quite a confusing process but necessary and then if you're if you're have brave enough to really look at yourself then maybe you know, the answer staring you right in the face yeah, that's deep, man. Really deep. I couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> so do you feel like sometimes you, you're such a versatile actor? Like you. your your catalog is so so long and um you can do almost any role. Do you feel like sometimes they categorize you? Absolutely, yeah people you know people don't i think i think people realize this because people are intelligent and you know most people are uh you know uh, consumers of media and they they're not stupid you know i don't think they understand that i like to believe they understand that unless you're a, a corporation kind of celebrity type that's tied in with the bank and that that level of power where you get to pick and choose uh, most of us were in the begging position and the boss tells you hey I got some a job for you to do. You don't tell the boss what you want. The boss tells you what they need. And for whatever reason, if they feel that uh, you're suited to be in a, 
a particular category, then that's the category that you're in. And all you have to do is you can do two things. You can say, nah, that's, I don't know. Or you can say thank you and be appreciative that someone's offering you a job. It all depends on how you look at it. If you look at it from the point of ego and vanity too much, then you get caught up in uh, taking things too personal. Um, you're out, it's better to just, I think, be humble and just be grateful that someone wants to give you some, give you a job. You know, you know, so is there a creative angst that some of us have to maybe spread our wings a bit and diversify? Absolutely. You know, and, and I think that's where patience comes in. And uh, you have to just be patient and hope that someone is brave enough or has enough insight to recognize that you can do something else other than what you, they think you're good. Well, he's really good at this. And so you do that for a while. And you keep doing it and you perfect it. And then maybe they go, someone sees something, they go, wait a minute though, there's a quality that I've noticed about this performer. Let's see if we can exploit that as well and make that bigger. You know, so it's just about someone in power or you know, has the uh, faith in you to give you the opportunity to demonstrate if in fact you can pull it off. You're not just self-portraiting. A lot of people, some people, I guess, you know, stories are written around their personality, their persona their culturism you know because america's you know apologizing for the injustices that have been done in the past and a lot of people have been ignored in uh cinema for decades and i think sometimes you know they'll build a story around that phenomenon that doesn't always address the creative size of things and and they'll write a story that's accommodating uh to the persona rather than the artist and my teachers always told me listen you can't do the self-portraiting thing. You got to step outside who you are and become someone else. And uh, I feel some of that's getting lost. The British are great at that. They can transform like that, you know. Yeah, but, like the, even their their accents, they could sure. like change it to an American accent. Like, yeah. how did they do that? Well, it's, they I'll tell you how they did. They went to school like I did, and you learn to you practice like anything else. You want to build a house, you're a carpenter, you want to become a master craftsman, you work at your craft and you perfect it. You change the way you behave, you change your, your mannerisms, you change your cadence of speech, your accent, all that stuff changes, man. You work on it. But a lot of people are lazy. You know, uh, some people are lazy, I think. Uh, not everyone. Let me take that back. Some people are lazy. And the difficulty is if the industry forced, fosters a practice of being lazy, then everyone thinks they can do it. 